Okay, well, welcome everyone. The, just, the start of all these it always takes a few minutes to get things up and running. Um, I'd like to welcome Kylie Williams, who's joined us. Most of you should be familiar with uh, Kylie and all her work in paediatrics. So how the, this, this webinar is going to run is I'm going to just uh, do a little editorial rant about some issues and then hand it over to Kylie and Ian to comment on. And then if there are any live comments, we might try and respond to those. And then we, Ian has a collection of questions that people have asked him to ask Kylie, and then, then we'll address those. Just one thing, what Ian and I do, uh, you're trying to concentrate on what's going on, manage the platform. We often can't keep up with the live comments. So to start this off, I'm just going to share my desktop. Um, I have prepared a little PowerPoint to remind me what I wanted to show. Um, but what led to today's um, inviting Kylie on? Just, just early last week, I think Ian and I both got into little fights with different people um, in various social media platforms, frustration over research. I think Kylie might have had a few in different places, and the three of us got chatting about these issues and decided that Kylie would um, suddenly be a, a, a good guest to have on to talk about some of these issues. But at the end of the day, the, people still haven't grasped the fact that the world's changed. It's not a flat earth. We function in a very, very different environment. Now, the regulations and rules that I'm subject to who, here to in Australia are not too dissimilar to others. The code of conduct for my regulation, regulatory authority, the Australian Health Professional Regulatory Authority, makes it really clear, practice in accordance with the current and accepted evidence base of the health profession and its social media policy said registered health practitioners should only post information that is not in breach of these obligations by presenting information in an unbiased evidence-based context and not making unsubstantiated claims. So the, the code of conduct and the social media policy are very, very clear that, that those of us registered in Australia have to adhere to. The rules are not too dissimilar anywhere else. So what that means is that if you practice in, an in a non-evidence-based way or support claims contradicted by the evidence, then your ability to practice is at risk. Here in Australia in the last two months, we've had two general medical practitioners suspended and two chiropractors suspended. They're subject to those same rules that I am. Those four health professionals that were suspended were suspended because they were making statements or practicing in a, in a way that was contradicted by the evidence. They weren't suspended. They, they were suspended pending a hearing, so they haven't even had their hearings yet. But they didn't put any one patient at harm. They didn't screw up once or twice. They were deemed to be practicing in a way that was contradicted by the evidence. Um, and that's in the last few months. Now, just before I move on to, to the next bit, what I want to do is I, I did blog about this study on my blog. Children growing up barefoot are more likely to be heel strikers when running. And it was a reasonably good study. The evidence was pretty clear. But it, you, you get quite horrified how people respond. And I just want to read this quote from Steve Novella. It, it, and I've come across this almost on a daily basis in my own work. It is almost inevitable that whenever we post an article critical of the claims being made for a particular treatment, alternative philosophy or alternative profession, someone in the comments will counter a careful examination of the published scientific evidence with an anecdote. Their argument boils down to, it worked for me, so all of your scientific evidence and plausibility is irrelevant. And the classic one, that I came across several people who had goes at me over my blog post because I grew up barefoot and I'm not a heel striker. And they, they just, to me, they were just showing they can't read research. The research showed more likely. Now, at the end of the day, I don't think anyone would argue that smoking is a risk factor for cancer. Uh, I don't think anyone would dispute that, but there are always going to be examples of people who smoke their whole life and don't give get lung cancer. That is not evidence that smoking is not a cause of lung cancer. The same with, and I'm not going to get into the debates about the terminology, you know, overpronation, the truth. The systematic reviews are really clear. Two studies have clearly shown that pronating too much is a risk factor for injury. It is a small risk factor, but it is still statistically significant. But then you get clowns, overpronation, the truth. And they'll post videos of people like Halle Gabrielessi who pronate a lot as evidence that it's all wrong. 
It's like the smoking and um, lung cancer analogy. So what you say and do has to be consistent with the preponderance of the evidence. If you practice in a non-evidence-based way or support claims contradicted by the evidence, then your ability to practice is at risk. You, know, you cannot d dismiss research that does not fit your worldview or pet theory. Um, I never cease to be amazed at the excuses people use when research does not support what they want to believe in. The excuses they use, the attacks that get made on researchers, they're clearly sh showing their inability to read research properly. They'll use comments like, um, research is only part of the picture. It's the, re the research is a big part of the picture when it suits their theory. It's a small part of the picture when it doesn't suit their theory. Uh, the, uh, the amount of cherry picking and logical fallacies go on. You know, we, we have degrees from a university. Um, that means you're actually supposed to have some sort of critical thinking, please. But I never cease to be amazed that those critical thinking skills must have been left at the university. When you look at graphs like this, not graphs, um, comparisons like this between science and pseudoscience, you know, classically pseudoscience is hostile to criticism. They cherry pick and is dogmatic and unyielding. And I'm sure we can all think and have probably interacted with people online in the last few weeks who get quite hostile when their pet theory is criticised. Good science is not hostile. It embraces criticism. Good science changes with the evidence. They use word salads, cliches, and logical fallacies to justify and support what they're doing because they just know more than the systematic reviews and the meta-analyses. Now, there are lots of, there are, say, sorry, there are legitimate and illegitimate reasons for dis dissing research. There's nothing wrong with putting down research when it's done legitimately, and I do that quite regularly in my two blogs. However, the illegitimate way of dissing research because it doesn't support your worldview is you can't ignore it. You can't use excuses. You can't dismiss research on petty, trivial issues. You can't apply double standards. You can't uh, go to extraordinary lengths to dismiss a study that you don't like the results of, but not apply those same evaluation standards to research that supports your theory. You can't contradict research with an anecdote. You can't be logical fallacies, and you can't just behave badly towards researchers just because what they show doesn't support what you are doing. And I'm, I'm not going to dwell on this point, but if you use tea tree oil clinically, should you be allowed to practice? If you practice in a non-evidence-based way or support claims contradicted by the evidence, then your ability to practice is at risk. And we've seen that happen in the last few months here in Australia. A good theory, a good idea, and good clinical practice is consistent with the preponderance of the evidence and moves with new evidence. And I think that's the key point. So I'll finish this little introductory rant with the terms critical thinking, please, and a reminder that if you practice in a non-evidence-based way or support claims contradicted by the evidence, then your ability to practice should be at risk. So I will stop there and hand over to Kylie and Ian to um, respond. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> yes, uh, Kylie, I am, I am drinking <laughs> at this time of the morning. <laughs> I'm not Ladies going anywhere with that one. Oh, <laughs> I wish you were here. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, Obviously, we, we we want to bring this on to uh, how people do, you know, how people read research, how they interpret it, and ultimately, what we want to get to is research translation, which I know is 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 where you're doing a lot of work at the moment, Kylie. So, I think we we could potentially say we well, let's ask you a question. What do we think is the biggest issue? Is it the people that that, that Craig sort of alluded to who are aware of the research but they ignore it because it doesn't fit their worldview? Is it the people who are keen to read research, but they just can't access it? Uh, or when they do access it, they, they, they're not too sure how to interpret it? Or, or is it sort of a, a combination of the two? Well, what's your take from, from the work you've done um, and how we all get better at this? Uh, look, I, I don't think you can blame one camp. Um, I think both are equally responsible sometimes for perpetuating myths and perpetuating non-evidence-based practices. Um, translation's really tough. You've got you've to do it. You've got to publish it. 
it's got to be um, accepted then by the group of professionals who are going to do it. And that's often where one of the challenges is, is, is in acceptance. It then also um, throughout that process of translation needs to be um, disseminated. And this is where we've sped up the process a lot. Um, it's, it's been both a good thing and a bad thing, having social media and Twitter, Facebook, um, ResearchGate, Research is becoming a lot more accessible to health clinicians, but then so is all the other stuff. And so it, it does put a lot of onus back on the health professional to actually ch continually challenge themselves. Um, I trained as a podiatrist a long time ago, and I if I continued to practice like I was, yeah, not as long as some, but if I train, if I continue <laughs> to work now, especially in peds, like I was trained, I've got photos of me um, fitting kids for Dennis Brown bars for in tow walking. I've got kids, I've got photos of me at university casting kids to the hip for um, internal rotation deformities. We don't practice like that because it doesn't have evidence. It's a hard thing to, um, it's a hard thing to change your personal views when you're not able to step outside of them it's it's for those that want to do some reading on cognitive dissidence it's a really interesting um rabbit hole to fall down and have some really um you got to step out of yourself and and display a little bit of emotional maturity and go okay this is the belief i actually hold does my belief and what i've seen does it align or contradict with the evidence and if so why and then also when I read the evidence, am I reading it correctly? Am I looking at the language that is being used? Am I reading the words right? Or am I skimming to the things that only apply or, or, or things that get me a little bit heated up? Um, as health professionals or as, as human beings, we'll always be attracted to things that we, um, our thoughts and our feelings align with. Um, it's a reason why our friends often hold similar beliefs. If you have friends that are smokers and you're very anti-smoking, you may not be friends with them for a long time. If you have friends that have um, political beliefs incredibly diverse to yours, to the point that you can't stand each other because of those political beliefs, you won't hang around at parties. You'll kind of actively avoid those people. And it kind of goes the same way with evidence. If you don't like it, you possibly, because of your own cognitive biases, will just plain avoid it. But as health professionals, we've got this massive responsibility to be critical. Like we, we shouldn't be bringing those thoughts and beliefs into the place of practice. But we've got to realise we're humans and, and that's what we do. And this is where being a emotionally mature health professional and recognise that we do that so that we can make those changes. That was a roundabout way of answering that question, I think. There's a lot of psychology behind this and I think that's one of the biggest challenges with um, where you've got anecdotes, where you've seen, look, we've all seen things work that shouldn't have. We've all seen, and this is why research papers have limitations written in them because we recognise that people aren't this homogeneous little pot of everything the same. But at the same time, when you've got really good evidence in, in your face, there's no reason why that shouldn't be your first, not your last point to go to. Or use those excuses I talked about to just ignore it or dish it, diss it or dismiss it. And I, yeah, I mean, and I, I think that the longer you've been out, the actual, uh, unless you're really keeping on top of things, um, I think... The, we're seeing a wave of, of um, more accessibility to evidence and to actually be able to access papers where we didn't, it used to be harder to do that unless you're in academia, the, the general private practitioner who's seeing 20 patients a day to sit down at night and actually read a paper about something. Well, first of all, you kind of got to find one you like. Um, or find one that's interesting, find one that's relevant. You've got to apply some critical thinking to it. You've got to understand how to read the paper. And the longer you are out from uni or academia, 
that gets harder. The language is hard. The format is hard. The statistical analysis is is really hard for lay people. And I guess this, as as a researcher, which is what I mainly do now, there's a lot of um, there's a lot more um, uh, responsibility to actually make things understandable for everyone. But the general clinician, there's also, you've got a responsibility to actually keep up to date. It, this is your livelihood. And there's lots of tools out there to help you do. Like there's a, a website called understandinghealthresearch.org. And it's um, a really nice tool that is public. It, it actually is a step-by-step help a health professional read an article sort of thing. It, it discusses limitations and it discusses how applicable it is to your your population or your general public um i I think there's more available but people just need to but the point i tried to make in my initial rent is they have a legal responsibility to do that it's not an option and as those two general practitioners and two chiropractors found out if you don't do it or go against what that evidence says you're not going to be allowed to practice anymore um it's dangerous yeah i I really do I, i i hold um I, I hold the, the point of view and, look, I do need to make the disclaimer. I do sit on the podiatry board of Australia. I probably should have done that. I These are my personal re- views. These are not the views of someone who sits on that representative body at all. Yeah. Um, I do think it is dangerous. Um, I think we're health professionals. I do think they're the, major- the minority, though. I, I, but the problem is they're incredibly vocal. The passion yeah. that someone sometimes has for non evidence-based practice may also um, tie very strongly with the business model, which is their livelihood and gives them the ability to put food on their table, send their kids to school. All of these sort of things really strongly challenge someone's cognitive dissonance and requires a lot of emotional maturity to say, oh, my goodness, am what I, is what I'm actually doing ethical? And, and clinicians do actually run into, a, um, I guess, that challenging when it's down the middle when there is no evidence or when the evidence is, is contradictory. We've recently just done a study around false prevention strategies in hospitals and what confused everyone the most is when there is um, com- conflicting evidence, when there is evidence for and against. Do they use this problem, do they use this solution um, to prevent a fall in hospital when there's evidence saying it works and evidence saying that it doesn't work, what happens when they see their mentors using it and they have a negative um, respect, um, reaction with something like that? I do think it places a huge onus on leaders to actually be very clear about what they're leading and what evidence supports what they're but leading. That, but when that evidence is contradictory, that's when you've got to put more and more reliance on the formal systematic reviews and meta-analysis that pulls all the data. What if, and, what if there is none? But, well, that okay, that's when you default to biological plausibility and theoretical coherence. What if there is none? Um. <laughs> <laughs> and see, yeah. unfortunately, in health, we are getting we are getting more and more in this, and mm. um, it, uh, and and this is really where um, we. Tra- I'm not going to go down funding for research and everything like that. It does get hard, but we do need to focus on translation. And it's quite possible that things failed in a research study because it wasn't a real world study. Like it might have been a little tiny pocket of people um, where you might have been doing a, a, the first level study where you had placebos or you had something, your, your comparator mightn't have been a great comparator or it might have been an excellent comparator, but not relative to the real world. Um, it, it's hard when things are already embedded in health systems. Take, try taking away um, bed alarms in a hospital. I'm not going to go down falls, but try taking those, those away. There's no evidence that they prevent falls, and yet they are um, built into infrastructure. We've got national standards around prevention of falls that include things like that. Um, it's, it's the same with uh, when a podiatrist prescribes custom orthotics for a child where there is no evidence supporting that, but the health insurance won't actually pay any rebates for a prefab it puts the health professional and the parent in a really challenging position to go, 
If I give you this custom device, it will cost you about $40, $50. If I give you this prefab device, it will cost you $90, $150. But there's no evidence for the custom device. It'll do exactly the same as the prefab device. It'll just cost you a lot less. And that's really challenging for a health professional. It's yeah. We, we we could have a whole another one of these webcasts just on that topic alone. Oh yeah, no, uh, don't invite me for that one. Yeah, uh, it's, can I um can I pitch in before we get onto peds? And I sense that might be where this is going, and it needs to go there because obviously it's Kylie Williams. Uh, I had a question text to me by uh, Doctor Simon Spooner, um, and it was on more on the topic of of research. So while we're kind of to research, I just wanted to throw it in if that's okay. Um, and he, was, he wanted to ask you how we can encourage more females to research, publish, lecture in, in the field of podiatric biomechanics, which, as we all know, is, I guess, historically been, um, been a bit more male-dominated, um, a bo- yeah, a boy, boys' club. Um, so, yeah, what, what, what's your take on it? Um, there's a lot of ways to encourage females to be um, researchers and um, I would say that from my experience, I'm late to the game. Obviously, I'm not a spring chicken. Um, I was a clinician for a very long time before I decided and was encouraged to do more with my life. Um, And you know what did it for me? I had excellent mentors that believed in me and told me that I could do it. And because my excellent mentors um, in my area were men, um, they were my biggest advocate. They were the one that put me forward as here is the person to talk to, this is an up-and-coming leader, this is the person who's going to do this. There's plenty of women in academia doing excellent biomechanics research. They are publishing, they um, have outstanding theories. Just look at um, one of Chris Nestor's PhD students who just won the three-minute thesis. The work that she's doing in biomechanics um, is, is um, going to be groundbreaking. So where do we see her in 10, 15, 20 years? If she goes away and has babies, because let's face it, we're the only ones that can, who is still saying to her, you can continue to do this and it's okay, step out for a little while because you need to. However, when you're ready to come back, we will keep pushing it for you. When you are a leader, it is your responsibility to lead And that involves ensuring that every single person underneath you has equal opportunity, if not more, than what you actually had yourself. Perfect. Um, (laughs) Is that okay, Simon? Would you like me to say anything more? (laughs) I'll just check if he's texting me. Um, (laughs) It seems a reasonable time to move into, just because you mentioned um, Chris Nestor's PhD student, Joe Joe Reeves. I was actually I actually went up there last week, and she she stuck a in a fine wire EMG into my tibialis posterior as part of her study. Right. And while I was there, while while I was there, um, Dr. Karina Price was kind enough to show me around the uh, the sort of PDA setup they've got there as part of Great Foundations, and it looked so amazing. It was essentially soft play with a with a force plate inside it and cameras pointing at it for sort of one-year-olds two-year-olds and I, I can't even get my kids to to sit at the dinner table for more than five minutes so I don't know how they're assessing kids but there's definitely people that are watching this that probably aren't aware of great foundations this um sort of collaborative project between uh, Salford and, and Brighton and I believe you, I'm right in saying you've you're part of it as well so um could you, do you want to give a little bit of a plug and just tell t- tell people about absolutely. it absolutely yeah, look, um, the, the Great Foundation is led by, um, by Chris and Stuart. So across, it's a collaborative effort across um, University in Salford and um, University of Brighton, funded by the Shoal Foundation, is a multi-level um, project looking at how children's feet are developing between crawling and walking, what messages parents are actually being given Um, and who they're being given them by, so what's being provided on the internet and um, how people are actually getting their information about their children's foot health. And then how do we take the learnings from both of those and embed that into clinical practice? So there's a large translation component in there, and I've just very recently, as in 
two weeks ago, spent some time over with the, the team looking at translation and looking at translation, everything from how it's actually been taught in universities, because let's face it, that's often the first place that you want to embed stuff. However, it's sometimes the first place that people are still being taught very out of date stuff. If we can ensure that paediatric curriculum is up to date with the latest evidence and how we actually do that, that's a long way. Because most of us, some of us, too many of us still treat like we were taught at university. And so if we can change that with the latest evidence and be able to give some critical thinking around paediatric foot development there, hopefully we'll see some translation of that in the future. But there's also additional translation um, uh, translation messages to the actual health profession and that's sort of the the next stage after the um, we're still nutting out how we're actually going to do that but it's going to involve a little bit about you guys will see some surveys coming out soon on how you want to receive evidence on children's foot health how do you actually want to um, get this absorb this learn this What's your learning style? What kind of learner actually are you? So, and it's going to go out to musculoskeletal um, podiatrists as well as paediatric podiatrists to understand is there actually differences between different professional groupings as well? I suspect there is. I, I know how peds podiatrists like to learn and I'm not sure it's the same as how sports podiatrists like to learn. So there'll be, there'll be stuff, but keep your eye out on their website, on their blog, Follow Great Foundations on Twitter. They're just, that team is just doing some excellent work. Yeah, totally agree. We'll, we'll link to it. Um, yeah, that'd we'll link be great. To it below in the Facebook comments, definitely. Yeah. Um, do, do you want to say anything, Craig, or can I, can no, I no, plow no. on with it? Next, next question, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so the next one, obviously, and it sort of brings in the same team, actually, uh, and it, it's pretty topical, is the, the paper that Stuart and, and I think Chris and Karina were on it, uh, published in JFAR a couple of weeks ago, um, which even as a non-paediatric uh, practitioner, I, I loved because it was about terminology and, and um, how we should move away from terminology. And it was essentially discussing the, uh, the, pe the paediatric flat foot and, and whether indeed... Um, uh, that's that's appropriate or uh, I just I assume you're in pretty much agreement with that paper oh, um, ab absolutely it's it's really tricky to to, to change um, terminology if I can do one thing in my career it's to get rid of Severs disease because it's not a freaking disease it's calcaneal <laughs> apophysitis it's an inflammation of the apophysis stop terrifying parents with calling things diseases um, don't call things after yourself um, <laughs> I think it's actually time, I think dialogue or linguistics in everything is always transient. We need to be contemporary. We need to be factual. Um, the, the calling a paediatric flat foot, well, all kids have flat feet. It's actually more unusual to not have a flat foot. So it actually is the paediatric foot. So I think it's, um, it's really exciting to, to see people jumping on board and thinking about those concepts and recognising that the language that we use is very powerful and it goes back to evidence as well. The language we use to consumers, the layman's language or plain English, is very, very powerful to how people interpret it and ensuring that the um, there is limited ambiguity in what we say and ensuring that we're very clear, succinct, we speak at a level that everyone actually understands reduces the, um, the hysteria that we can get over thinking things are far worse. As health professionals, sometimes we can make our living from pathologising things. We sp I work in paediatrics. We love to give kids a diagnosis. We love to give kids a diagnosis because often it leads to funding and it leads to additional services being provided for these kids. But where that's not the objective, kids come in all shapes and sizes of abilities and disabilities where there's no imperative to label something in a negative way, then why do it? Actually, just, just on that is... Um Sorry, as Ian knows, I just did a course last weekend and Ian's done the same course. And I think there are quite a few take-homes I got from that. But one was about the language around pain and how getting that yeah. language wrong can actually make them worse. Absolutely. Uh, and it's so yeah. crucial. And, and um, I'm sure Ian, you know, Ian's done that same course and knows exactly what I'm talking about. And it, it's, yeah. it's, 
there's, we've got a lot to learn about that. <laughs> yeah. I'll give um, Nina Davies a little plug. She did an excellent presentation at the UK conference. It was one of the highlights for me where she talked about in-towing and um, about what to do about children who in-tow. And um, we know there's no evidence for treating or the evidence for treating is based on cosmesis only. So if you, um, um, I'm not going to list all the different things, but she talked a lot about gaining the parents um, trust and understanding that this is a transient phase that kids will go through and how to um, encourage um, motor skills where a child is struggling with them because they're really in towed um, and getting the, the, the language that was used in that consultation, the understanding of um, what tow walking, uh, what in tow walking actually is, and how it changes as kids grow, and how children can develop skills um, through play rather than strict exercise programs. How kids can de um, develop skills and improve their own body perception, knowing where all their little body parts are through different play activities, and not prescribed. Um, exercises of any sort, but encouraging um, meaningful play with, with parents and kids to help kids understand where their body parts are. And it was just a lovely way of um, thinking about the language that we use and the um, responsibility that we actually have as health professionals to sometimes downplay um, downplay a lot of parents' concern, but to do it in a very sensitive and meaningful way that, that you're both on the same page. Do, do you still find, I've not worked in paediatrics for may, maybe a decade. So, I mean, I, I seem to recall in my, my sort of brief time in a, in a paediatric clinic in the NHS setting here, um, I was, I was tr treating the parents, so to speak, um, way more than I was doing anything else. You know, basically, do you still find that's the case? 2017, you're still, oh, you're still look, sort of uh, dealing with anxious parents more than you are actual problems? I guess it depends where you work. You can't, no, you can't separate the parents from the child. That question's asked a lot. Are you treating the parents rather than the child? But the thing is, when you're mm. treating the parents, you actually are treating the child. You've got to see this family as a family unit. You can't, the child wouldn't get to you without the parent. <laughs> the child's not going to do anything without the parent. Um, so you actually, you can't separate the two. Yes, you do spend a hell of a lot of time sometimes um, re uh, discussing challenges that the parents are actually having, but, but that's their story. Um, that, that's what's going on for them. And if they have a concern, then it's a real and valid concern. It's really hard to, it's something I've struggled over the last couple of years moving from um, a hospital or health base where we were seeing some really yucky stuff with kids and a lot of yucky stuff. Um, to move more, I just work privately now and I still do get yucky stuff come through the door where um, I know that these kids are going to have um, some incredibly um, terrible problems for the rest of their life and then you sort of sit there with a parent who has a child who is in towing you kind of go oh it's the least of your worries however that's <laughs> their child that is their worry that is their child is every single thing to them and their world what makes their concerns any less valid and the parents sitting in front of you um, asking questions about when my child's in a wheelchair how are we going to fit shoes how am I going to ensure that they're able to sometimes still walk um, every single child and every single parent brings their own stuff when they come in and you've just got to remember that every single time they come in excellent um, go on Craig you got something to say well I'm just saying I think both Kai and I have to go soon to do our parenting stuff um, yeah get kids off to school <laughs> you've already got, you already got mine, yours mine are, mine are in bed, mine are in you bed. Got any more questions yeah. there uh yeah i had one actually and and i think i'd like to think it's it's a good one um so for the for the for the less confident in pediatrics and i very much include myself in that by the way um for people that are seeing mostly adults day in day out and then all of a sudden in clinic in in pops in in pops a, a seven-year-old a you know an eight-year-old whatever it may be um 
and all of a sudden what comes flooding into your mind is uh, what was my pediatric assessment I was taught at university what are the the, the, the things I need to ask mum you know what are the things in a history I really shouldn't be missing is there a a top three, a top five, there are things that regardless of age, regardless of pathology, you're always going to ask and you're always going to clinic the, the, the gems for the non-peds uh, specialists. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think that's an excellent question. It's something that we do get asked a lot. I don't have time. I've got 20 minutes and I've just got a six-year-old come in. What the hell do I do? My biggest advice is to always be prepared why do you think your your assessment form or your process for an adult should be any should be the same for a child have your be, be prepared have a template have a different new patient form that the parent actually completes some of the information for you um, it is actually really important, probably not for your 16-year-olds, but it is important to actually ask about a child's first year of life, what they did. When you've got a kid who walks in and they walk in pretty funny, now, look, I, I don't want to open the toe-walking floodgate, but if I have a 10-year-old come in with toe-walking, I need to know his birth history. Um, I, I just, I've got to know it because it might be mild CP. And especially if he's 10, it quite probably is. Um, so... Having, um, if, if you don't have time, have the parent have the, have the form there that they've already completed it so you can have a quick glance. That's one, one way you've knocked a big chunk of your consultation and questioning out. Um, and if you see anything on there, actually realise that it's okay to not get through everything in that first 20 minutes. The, the next things to me not to miss is, is gait. As podiatrists, we're really, really good at looking at walking. We're looking at symmetry. We're looking at, at older kids, heel strike, mid, -stri mid stance, toe off. We're looking at how the body is actually functioning. But we've got to remember that little people do things slightly. So you need to put that lens on. So video it. So don't, don't feel you have to commit to something in that moment. Have a bit, have a, your iPad on a, little tripody thing that you you put down and video the gate and never never be afraid to tell the parent I really need to sit back and have a look and have a think about this um, when things aren't looking as great as you think they should for me the third the, I guess the third thing is um, reflexes and neurology um, Podiatrists are really crap at it, and I don't know why, because they're really good at diabetes. They kind of forget that a new, uh, reflex hammer actually exists, and they kind of go, oh, if, a, if they walk in, they've probably got a reflex. No, that's bullshit. Um, they're, they're, oh, sorry. Um, it's The funny walk is, <laughs> is potentially due to um, various things. Um, we're neurological beings, and sometimes good morning, and sometimes... Um, we need to be able to know what normal is so that we don't, so that we know what abnormal is. So we need to be really good at doing reflex, um, at patellar reflexes, Achilles reflex, and understanding what a plantar reflex means. It takes five seconds. Do it on your oldies so you know what they look like. Um, practice on people with diabetes so you know what abnormal looks like. Pa practice on your old alcoholics so you know what it actually looks like abnormally so that when you see it in <laughs> a child, you know what it should or shouldn't look like. And then don't be afraid to say, um, I don't know, look, good, have some good shoes and I'm going to see you in a week and um, I'm going to think about what I've seen where it's not as clear cut because, look, most times it is something really simple, especially in <laughs> year olds It's the kooky kids that come in and walk on their tiptoes or are asymmetric or have weird pains. Don't forget there's some really serious conditions. Don't be the one that misses CP. Don't be the one that misses juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Um, download the Gallup. I'll give a plug for a systematic paediatric assessment pro forma that guides you as to what um, assessments should be done for kids. It's published in JAPA. Craig's got to go. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just getting little signals from over here. It's school soon. <laughs> um, 
I, I think we, we've gone for 42 minutes. I just see Simon Spooner just posted, now Kylie is getting interesting. Don't cut her off. Um, <laughs> sorry, Simon, but uh, Kylie's got to go. And- <laughs> I've got to be a mum. Sorry. <laughs> and so do I. So if you've got no more questions in, I think we can uh, perhaps wind it up now. We've gone for just over 40 minutes. Yeah. Um, so for those of you not familiar with this Facebook Live if you, and have only just joined us near the end, if you come back in about 15, 20 minutes, Facebook processes the whole video and it's, it's, it's there from start to finish for those that want to um, go and listen to my rant at the beginning. Um, so, again, thank, thanks so much, Kylie. Um, it's been great. Um, I'll keep an eye on the comments and um, pop a yeah. few things in there for you. Sure, so yeah. um, a few what not to miss and a few little I'll, – I'll keep an eye on it over the next week or so. Yeah, sure. So, Ian, do you want to finish up? No, I'll uh, I'll try and add uh, once it goes live. Uh, once once it's it's on Facebook, I'll I'll add as many links as we can to the JFAR paper, to Great Foundations, and some stuff like that. Okay. Well, thanks again, everyone. I will cool. just stop the.